It took some time and a lot of thought, but I'm finally ready to tackle my analysis of Kyoshin. Now, you could argue I've already done this before during a live stream and in my Heroes in History, but those were early looks at the hero. Now that I've gotten him near Reputation 10 and have played him extensively, I feel more prepared to offer my analysis of the hero. As always, we'll start with his historical and cultural connections, then his personality. We'll talk about his default armor and weapons versus my current look. And then we'll go through his movesets, talking about what's good about them and what advice I can offer. We'll then wrap up after talking about his executions, and then I'll give my official grade to them. Ready? Let's do it. Let's dive into Kyoshin. Now, Kyoshin's name means impartial, and it's a good way to describe the Kyoshin in For Honor's lore. According to what Ubisoft has told us, the Kyoshin are children born with strange abilities or traits that make many people believe that they are the spawn of yokai. These children are sent to a monastery or temple deep in the mountains to train their skills. They, there they are given an education, given training in martial combat, and given spiritual disciplines. All of this is meant to forge them into spiritual warriors, and at the end of their training, they take a pilgrimage into the spiritual realms and emerge enlightened and fulfilled. The Kyoshin side with neither good nor evil, because to them, the two opposing forces create a balance in the world. When one force is stronger than the other, then it is their job to fix the balance. The massive civil war between Chimera and Horkos has created a literal consequence in nature of this imbalance. A drought. Supposedly this drought is the result of the imbalance in nature caused by the war and the horrible misuse of Draconite. Now the Kyoshin's home is disturbed and their ways threatened. So it's time for them to emerge and correct the imbalance, fighting anyone who would threaten the stability of nature and the spiritual world. In my Heroes in History video, I said that the Kyoshin are most likely based on Yamabushi, mountain sages who also believe firmly in balance in oneself, in nature, and in spirituality. Yamabushi perfected and established the art of Shugendo, and they believe firmly in mind over matter, that one can impact their physical and mental health through meditation and understanding of the natural world. They seek supernatural answers to life's mysteries, and they believe firmly in the supernatural presence in all things. While not necessarily warriors in the ways we should think of them, the hermits of the Yamabushi were trained in martial arts to some extent and would have known how to defend themselves. The largest contrast I can think of between the Yamabushi and Kyoshin are in terms of their philosophy. The Yamabushi believe that nature keeps itself in balance, and that it is our job to understand and find that balance. The Kyoshin believe that the balance is ours to protect, and that they make it an active role in defending it. So one is a lot more passive, the other a lot more active. Now, before I go on, some have pointed out in my previous video that the Yamabushi might not be the only influence for the Kyoshin. Some have said that the Buddhist warrior monks like the Sohei and the Ikoiki could be major influences because of their militaristic way of life and their high spiritual beliefs. Now, I can see the connection there, and I can even respect that viewpoint. However, I would argue that there are a few discrepancies. For starters is the manner in which the Sohei behaved. Found in the Heian period, the Sohei began having major impacts on the political world of Japan. Because they weren't samurai, they were not bound to their own territories or lands and could pop up where they liked, whenever they liked, having key location advantages that the samurai and daimyo could not overcome easily. They sided with whoever was most advantageous to them and acted almost as religious fundamentalists. They played key roles in the social, political, and military theaters of Japanese history, all the way through the end of the Sengoku Jidai. However, it's in this that I see a huge problem. Kyoshin do not take active roles in such things, and neither did the Yamabushi. Had their temple not been attacked, and had the war not impacted the natural order of the world, the Kyoshin might never have gotten directly involved in the war, thus acting more as hermits who wanted to be left alone than religious extremists looking to take control of affairs. Secondly, Yamabushi actively sought supernatural answers to life's mysteries and they preferred to be left alone. Meanwhile, the Sohei actively war warred with each other over religious differences as well as warred with daimyo and samurai classes to gain territory and political influence. Just from a personality standpoint and from a philosophy standpoint, I think the Yamabushi just connect better. While I see the possible influences the Sohei have on the Kyoshin, I just feel that the Yamabushi connect far more easily and more directly. If you look at the Kyoshin and think that they're more like the Sohei, that's fine. You're free to think that from an aesthetic point of view but and from their warrior nature. But I think that overall and in general, the Kyoshin are far more reminiscent of the Yamabushi for their reclusiveness, their philosophy on life, their ideals and spiritual identity, all that stuff put together just leads me to believe that they're more like the Yamabushi or Karasu Tengu, not the Sohei. The Sohei were far more military extremists, uh, religious extremists, and f religious fundamentalists. They fought to obtain political, social, and territorial power in Japanese history. 
and had a major impact on the political theater. Whereas the Yamabushi and the Kyoshin really weren't looking for that. Okay? Okay. Now, when I look at the Kyoshin, I see a man who wants to find the answers. Born as something he doesn't understand with gifts he doesn't grasp, he seeks understanding, and through this seeking, he finds purpose. He blinds himself to the physical world because he understands the material world offers him nothing that will sustain him. Instead, he seeks to view the spiritual world to discover his meaning, his purpose, and his direction. He is reclusive, antisocial, and very stubborn. He will aid the meager peasant, but will not entertain the whims of nobility. He will chastise those who seek power and money, while offering a healing hand to those who seek guidance like himself. He's a warrior, but also a wanderer. Both a part of a core group of brothers from his temple, yet also an individual meant to find his own way. I just really like the aesthetic. I think it's awesome. Now, with that out of the way, let's take a look at his armor. The lore says that the Kyoshin are masters of disguise and that they tend to dress as the samurai higher class. I buy that too, looking at his default. Here we see the Kyoshin wearing a kimono and hakama. Now, it's funny because some people have tried to tell me in comments that only girls wore kimonos. Well, the word kimono literally means thing to wear. It can refer to most clothes if taken into its literal sense. But really, there were kimonos for men and women. And here, the Kyoshin wears a kimono robe with hakama legwear. He also is wearing a kataginu jacket. All of this is worn to form what's called a kamashimo outfit. These outfits were normally worn by the samurai nobility, light and flexible enough for nimble movement and sudden combat readiness. They were also austere enough to show one's status and position. You can still find and buy these outfits today, but they are mostly worn in the modern day strictly for ceremonies like weddings and the like. For the head, he has really long anime style hair with a partial blindfold. According to the lore, the Kyojin have supernatural eyes that allow them to see into the spiritual world. They hide this eye through blindfolds, partially or fully blinding themselves. And it's a cool idea, but I'd be lying if I didn't say that it was a bit weird for a warrior to blind themselves. I have to assume that their spiritual eyes let them see their enemy as well, or it would be literal suicide to fight someone without the ability to see them. I know in my previous video I mentioned the inspiration from Zatoichi the Blind Swordsman, but Zatoichi is fictional, so I wouldn't watch him and assume it's a good idea to fight blindly. Now the weapon he's using is called a Shiko Mizue. This is essentially a cane sword. It can be used both as a walking cane and as a blade. The blade is straight edged, making it easy to pull out of its scabbard, and it's short enough for swift and easy movement. Again, this is a reference to Zatoichi, as this was his go-to weapon, and it really does fit with the blind warrior motif they're going for. It also fits his hermit lifestyle and reclusive way of living. He keeps himself sheathed at all times, always hidden and appearing as nothing but a simple hermit. But when crossed and when disturbed, the average cane becomes a deadly weapon. Now, let's talk about my Kyoshin. We've looked at the default Kyoshin. Let's take a look at mine. Yeah, that's my Kyoshin. Now, I have two sets for the Kyoshin, but this is my first one and the one we'll be using for most of the video. I kind of wanted to go for a burning forest kind of idea because I really wanted him to sort of be this um, fiery warrior. I also really like the alternative uh, style because what Ubisoft did with Kyoshin, it's the first time they've done this, you can actually change the hair color based on what material you're using. So you can have him have silver hair, uh, bronze hair, green hair red hair. I went with the firewood look, which is more of a brown hair kind of thing. I thought that looked a lot better. He's fully blindfolded, which again is kind of silly for fighting, but it also looks really badass and very anime. And hey, if you're going to go for a full on anime look, just go the full mile, you know? Um, got the fiery back here with the blazing phoenix behind him. I thought it would really fit. You know, like maybe his eyes were burned out or something like that. Because if you look very closely, it looks almost like his eye was scorched rather than cut. Which I think is very unique. It's very cool. And as we go further into it, we'll get to see more about how he uses his executions, which is sweet. The sword I'm using here is called the Curse of the Spirit's Blade. And I don't know why. I just think the color scheme and the look of it just looks awesome. It is very, very cool. Now, before we move on, let's take a look at my other design. This is the other look. This is more of my Oni look. And uh, it's a lot less impressive, but it's a lot more terrifying, I would say. You got this Oni mask uh, with dark hair behind him, and it's the alternate, so you can change the um, hair color, again, based on what material you're using. You got this sort of Two-Face style mask where you have a burnt, demonic one side, and then a clean, um, 
horn cut off uh, other side showing the duality good versus evil and you can see that um, you can see the eye more clearly on one side than the other you know the covered eye sort of thing going on you got tattoos all over the body kind of like what um Shaolin does you got a partial kimono covering no hakama this time you can see his pants his trousers uh, but it just looks really intimidating and I think it's a really cool look all right so with all that out of the way, now that we finished talking about his look and what I designed for them, let's go ahead and take a look at his moveset. In terms of Kyoshin's moveset, Kyoshin has a two-hit combo streak. Light heavy, heavy light, heavy heavy, or light light. Every secondary attack has an undodgeable quality. Making it a lot easier to land the attacks that I need to. He also has a, do a side dodge heavy, which can flow into one of his secondary attacks. After his first attack, he can do a bash, which opens up for a free light. You can do a heavy after it, but it's not guaranteed. After a guard break, you get access to a free heavy which is a great way to open up for your next attack. You can also do a dash forward um, kick. It opens up for a light. All these are great ways to get in your openers and it's a great way to mix up with your warrior. The thing that I really like about Kyoshin is that undodgeable quality. It makes him very good against assassin characters who are very dodge happy. One thing that I like to do is I like to mix things up. As I go into that undodgeable, I cancel out and go into a guard break. Because quite often what they're going to try to do is they'll either dodge instinctively or they will try to parry your attack. And if they try to parry, then it's a lot easier to get in that guard break. Now, another thing that he has access to is a crushing counter. If I do a light attack in the same direction of one of his attacks, I can not only block his attack, but go right through it. So if my brother will attack me. Again. This can be done from any direction, as long as I hit the light at the same time that my brother does the attack. This is a really great way to keep the combo going, and will go into his feet, which we will talk about in a minute. He also has a zone attack, which goes into his combo. The zone attack will always come out from his left side, so keep that in mind when doing it. But none of this is what Kyoshin is really good at. Kyoshin is built around one specific move, his Kaze Sand. Kaze means wind, and if you're looking at it right now, I am currently in Kaze stance. It is his version of an all guard. That's right. He is a samurai with an all guard that lasts. He's like conqueror, warlord, black prior. But what I like about his Kaze stance is it doesn't drain any stamina until someone attacks me. So if my brother will attack. Notice that at that point it does drain a little bit of stamina, and I don't regain it until I drop out of Kaze stance. Now, from Kaze stance, no attack other than guard breaks and unblockables can hurt me. But if I'm guard broken... Go over here and guard break. Oh yeah, bashes too. Thank you for pointing that out. Bashes can also break through. Now, let's talk about what you can do from Kaze stance. From Kaze stance, I have access to three different forms of attack. I can do a light attack, which comes out crazy fast, but always comes out from the right side. <laughs> I can do a zone attack, which will always come out from the left side. Or I can do an unblockable overhead heavy attack, which is much slower than the other two, but can be canceled. I really like to cancel into a guard break because most players will either want to parry you or dodge you. When it lands, it does a good, pretty good amount of damage. You can't see right now because I've got damage turned off. But from it, I can go right into this. Now, that quadruple light attack is the bread and butter of Kyoshin. After any attack, be it the zone attack or the light attack, as long as the light attack isn't blocked, it allows me to go into that sudden storm of lights. Now, the lights themselves don't do a lot of damage which is why I don't usually finish off with all four. I like to go into a heavy. Now here's why. Here's the cool thing about Kyoshin's Kaze stance. It takes a minute for Kyoshin to go into Kaze stance, but 
If I do a hit at all, I can instantly access it by pulling back on the guard button or the guard analog stick. Even if the attack is blocked, I can immediately go into it. So what I like to do is I like to do my Kaze, my Kaze attack and then do a heavy attack so I can go right back in and then continue my assault. Keep in mind that each time you do one of those attacks you do drain some stamina so keep an eye on your stamina bar. Plus most opponents will start to grow wise to what you're doing so it's a good idea to mix things up. So you may start with an, with an, undo with an unblockable then do a light, then follow up with another light. Mix it up. Decide what combo works best for you. This is what Kyojin is built around, and his feats also complement it. We don't have time to go into the feats here, but I will briefly explain what each one is designed to do. His first feat allows him that after he gets a crushing counter or a counter using his Kaze stance, he immediately gains a bleed effect. His second feat adds a healing effect to any attack after that initial counter. His third feat allows you to do it without the counter, and his fourth feat lets him summon spikes from the ground to trap his opponents. Kyoshin is a great anti-ganking warrior. He's actually not as strong as I'd like him to be in one-on-one -on -one fights. I think he works a lot better in a ganking scenario where he can get that healing back through attacks, he can take advantage of his Kaze stance, countering other people's attacks, but you got to keep in mind a few things about Kyojin. He has his fair share of weaknesses. Like I said, the light attack storm that you just saw really doesn't do a whole lot of damage on, it, on its own. And because of that, you can't rely on it to win you a fight unless you know that your opponent is really low on health. Plus, he has the same weakness as every other person with an all guard, and that is guard breaks. If you're caught doing this when, when someone guard breaks you, you cannot counter them. So it's a good idea to never stay in this for too long. Quickly go into it fast and then retaliate. Don't stay in this for so long that your opponent has a chance to guard break you. Get out of it. Don't stay in it too long. Don't be predictable. The problem with Kyoshin is that his entire move set revolves around this move. So because of that, you need to make sure... Yep, there you go. See, just like that. Because of that, you need to make sure that you are capable of countering what they throw at you. You need to be, make sure that you're not just going into Kaze stance. You're also doing other things. Drop out of Kaze stance to prepare for that guard break. You do, a, do your own guard break. Try not to be predictable. And that's, what the, that's the key to Kyoshin, I found. If you stick to one method of attack like your Kaze stance, they're going to see the weakness behind it and bash you or guard break you or unblockable hit you. Like, I can't tell you how many Sanhus have walked circles around me because of their unblockable. And if this isn't working for you, switch up into guard breaks. Use your undodgeable attacks. Change things up. And try to focus on controlling the opponent and where they're standing. I love the guard break, the fact that he gets that free heavy. There's lots of options from what you want to do with Kyoshin, but that about covers Kyoshin's movesets. That covers what he has to do, and if I could offer any one piece of advice, it's like I said, mix things up, be unpredictable, and even though Kaze stance is probably his bread and butter, I wouldn't rely on it too much, and if you do use it, don't go for the final light. Throw in that heavy, because that's going to actually get you more options and allow you to do even more damage. All right, now with that said, I think it's time for a brief duel.
to know your fucking place, trash. So proud, but so betrayed. Okay guys, we're back, and after going through all that with Kyoshin, I think it's finally time we take a look at his executions, so let's not waste any time, go right into them, there are only four. You've seen them all before, but let's just give them all their effective grade. You ready? Alright, so the first one is called Savage Sandstorm. You like the fire effect? I thought that that fit with his outfit, but let's see it again. Okay, so the first step of the execution is he blocks their punch with his scabbard. That's cool. Then he goes into reverse hand grip of the sword, and that's going to lose points for me. Reverse hand grips don't make sense. They aren't much more effective than holding it the right way, and in fact, you're not going to get as much of a slash out of it because you're limited by your wrist now. Shadversity did us a great video talking about this. So I've got to take away some points for that. Now the fluidity of it, block, slash, 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 and then a follow-up punch. I like that he goes down on one knee. He follows through with the punch, which strikes the neck, I believe. Or the head, either one. Let's see it from the other perspective. Yep, looks like it cut across the face or the neck, so it's definitely deadly. And I really like how he ends it. He ends it by cleaning his blade on his sleeve. Watch again. I like the, I like the effect, too, because it looks like he's wiping off the flames. Look one more time. Yes. Now, in reality, when you're cleaning your sword, you'd want to use a cloth of some kind to clean it, not your sleeve. But the sleeve clean looks really badass, so let's give him that much. Um, but yeah, it looks really, really cool. I'm going to have to give this one an 8 out of 10. I think that the fact that it does all that is really cool. Um, but the reverse grip is not that effective. And I think that's my only real problem with it. Everything else about it works really well. So 8 out of 10 works. All right, next. Through the head. Okay, I'm just going to say it. I hate this execution. It is easily the worst one Kyoshin has. It's absolutely terrible. I hate this execution with a passion. So let's break down why, and we'll start with the very beginning. Pulls out the blade. Let's go. Okay. The kick is fine. The follow-up kick is fine. That kills it. That destroys it. Look very carefully at the order in which he throws that. He will first throw the scabbard. And for some reason, the scabbard goes right through the dude's head. I hate this. Look again. You what? 
And no, some people have tried to say, oh no, what happens is the scabbard just hits the back of the head, but then when he throws the blade into the scabbard, um, it pushes it through the head. No. The scabbard went through his head before the blade made contact. So they're saying that the scabbard could go through a human head. This, this is, is not okay. This needs to stop now. No, that is not possible. It's probably one of the dumbest things I've seen in any execution. I cannot buy that. Now, I will give it some points because of the accuracy in which he threw the blade. He threw that thing right into the scabbard, which is nearly impossible to do. And the two kicks starting off are pretty cool to watch. But that bit right there, the death blow, is terrible. Now, I would not mind a silly execution if it was really fast and really cool, but this isn't that cool. He's disarming himself. He's taking his time retrieving the blade, and it's not realistic how it's silly. It's not even something where I could say, oh, I can, sus I can extend my suspension of disbelief for this. I can't. It looks stupid, and it takes too long for it to be practical. So I give this one a 3 out of 10. This is awful. Mighty, might of the winds, might of the winds. Here we go. Oh, that's so good. Very anime, very anime. You know, and we talk about this in my Heroes in History video. It's a pop culture reference to anime where they sheath the sword and the enemy falls as the sh sword clicks back into its scabbard. Watch again. Slide in and click. Very, very cool. Very badass. And I believe it took the head off. Let me have a look. Yep, that head rolled off. That head rolled right off. Okay, so what am I going to grade it? Um, I'm going to give this one a 7 out of 10. It's a little too anime to be realistic, but the strike to the neck is good. And I just don't think that it would have enough force to come take off the head that easily. And even if it did, it should have come off right away. But then again, we're, we're going into anime logic here, so do what you will with that. It looks so cool, though. It's so satisfying to see it pull off. It is very badass. So, yeah, I definitely like it. It's one of my favorites, but I got to give it a 7 out of 10 for realism points. Still really awesome, though. And last one, Celestial Discipline. Oh, way to finish it. I love this one. It's my favorite one Kyoshin has. But let's grade it. So what am I going to give it? Okay, so starting from the top, he sheaths his sword, pokes his opponent in the chest, they grab it, yanks the sword out, stabs in the gut, and then in the head, pulls it out, and as the opponent falls, it resheaths his blade. Incredibly badass. Incredibly stylish. Very cool. Couple problems. Um, number one. Why does the warden hold it? Why is the opponent holding the scabbard the whole time for him? The moment he died, his body should go limp and he should collapse. He should not still be gripping that scabbard. Yeah, the fact that he still holds it is stupid. It's still badass, but it's stupid. And then the other part, and this is kind of just a nitpick, but still. He does not clean the blade before resheathing it. And you might be thinking, well, why is that a problem? Well, contrary to what you might be thinking, blood and guts on a blade can actually wear down the blade. And if you fill up your scabbard with the blood and guts, it just means that you're, every time you resheath your sword, you're just constantly covering them in that blood and guts. It will gunk up the inside of your scabbard, making it smell bad, making your blade constantly dirty and dulling it. It's not a good way to keep your blade clean. That's why it's always a good idea to clean your blade. Now, you might be saying, oh, come on. Can't you just wash out the inside of your scabbard? You can, but it's very, very difficult and time-consuming. And in a world where you're constantly at war, you may not have time to always do that. So, poor blade maintenance. And a warden who can't, keep, who can't figure out that he needs to let go of a freaking sheath. Or scabbard, in this case. However, the move is deadly... It's fluid, and it's incredibly good. It's incredibly satisfying. I will give it a 9 out of 10. It is a very, very cool execution. I enjoy using it. It is so dominating. I love using it on enemies who really pissed me off in the match. It just feels good. All right.
And that about does it for Kyochin, guys. All right, so any final words of advice? Any last things I can say? So as I said in his moveset video, don't rely too much on his all guard if you're new to him. Try to mix things up with your undodgeable attacks and try to feint into guard break sometimes. It can throw off your enemies. Also be aware that guard breaks are your mortal enemy and smart players are going to take advantage of that. Try to avoid falling back on Kaze Stance too often. And if you do go into Kaze Stance, don't hold it too long. Try to get in some fast attacks as quick as you can so that you're not opening yourself up to that guard break. Because trust me, your opponents are going to take advantage of that. But otherwise, he's a very cool addition to the Samurai Faction. He has a great aesthetic. He's got great style. He's all around just an absolute badass with a cane sword. I wasn't really sure what to expect with the new Samurai here that they were going to add. And I was making a lot of guesses and predictions. I don't think I could have predicted anyone quite as cool as Kyoshin. Does he annoy me? Yeah, and I won't. And I'll definitely, I'd definitely be lying if I said that he was the strongest samurai. But he has this way of fighting that makes him his own. He is not just a copy carbon copy of Orochi as many people thought he would be. Even I thought he would just be a carbon copy of Orochi, and he's definitely not. He's very cool. I enjoy playing him. If you don't already have him, I think you'll enjoy playing him too. He's just an all-around fun hero. Okay, guys, thank you for joining me on this Kyoshin analysis, and I will see you in my next video. Take care.